this recording I'm doing on Zoom today is an attempt to replicate a presentation I gave last summer at Vegan Summerfest 2023. And it's called Omnivore, Omnivore, Bingo. Okay, Omnivore, Bingo. That phrase goes back, it's a meme phrase, you know, it goes back for decades. And the idea is that somebody comes up to you and gives you an objection to veganism and you say, oh yeah, tell me some objection I haven't heard. And then when they do come up with a creative one, you say, well, that wasn't on my bingo card. So that's basically the idea be behind the title. Um, Summerfest picked, <laughs> picked this proposal. So that's where we are. Let me share my screen. We'll get started here. Share screen. Share screen. Aha, we're sharing a screen. And we're doing slideshow, right? Okay, here we go. Common objections to veganism and practical responses. I think it's very important that we take on these objections and pull the objections into a conversation and talk about whether veganism is objectionable in reality or if the objections to vegan veganism are actually the objectionable it, uh, things. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, we, we looked at this in the studio and patrons of the Art of Animal Liberation uh, seem to think that this was most of, this, this reflects most of what we hear when people are objecting to us as vegans. Oh, it's impossibly idealist. People won't change. I can I can relate to that objection sometimes. Uh, at least the, the person object, objecting realizes that we are talking about an ideal. And, you know, all ideals are... That's what they are. They're, they're ideas about what we could be, who we could be. And they always make it, they, it, it always feels for advocates that people won't change, right? So, okay. Uh, vegans jeopardize their health. Well, that is just patently wrong. And we'll look at that in a minute. It's a benefit to farm animals to be brought into existence. Whew. Um, that one, although it does come up from time to time from people who have never read a book by Peter Singer, that is a classic Peter Singer objection, utilitarian objection, that you know, they wouldn't have their lives to experience at all if it weren't for us uh, exploiting them. <laughs> it's not funny, really. And a kind of an offshoot of that is I only buy cage free. Uh, I guess if you thought it's okay for animals to be brought into existence, and in, in, in fact, you think it's a benefit, well, then you would buy cage free, I suppose, because you wouldn't object to the animal husbandry, but you try to do it in a nicer way. Um, the animal advocacy movement has been talking about the success, the great success of the cage-free egg movement for quite some time. And that is also Peter Singer's, one of Peter Singer's key statements that the cage-free idea is the, one of the successes of the animal advocacy movement. I think that's kind of a shame. I mean, if we think that, oh, I only buy cage-free, that's kind of an improvement. Um, that's not a, I, I, I think that doesn't say what the people who are excited about it think it says, think it says about us as advocates. Anyway, 
vegans are always pushing their views. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Glad you think so. Veganism is just too extreme. You know, it's kind of like idealist, but not as not not as uh, complimentary, just too extreme. This is very close to it. Vegans are antisocial because we're too extreme. So we find it difficult to hang out in social at social events. Mm, it's probably that we uh, we get tired of seeing the results of animal exploitation being celebrated at parties and conferences and social events. That's not the same thing as being antisocial. I just wanted to bring that up. But I could never give up fill in the blank. Uh, cheese usually goes in that blank. Most people say we could never give up cheese. I get it, but you know, there's no excuse anymore because we've had people like Miyoko Shinner and others who have developed vegan cheeses that are absolutely Phenomenal. So, yeah, the answer to that one is pretty easy because you just pass them the cheese. Pass them the good bacon cheese. Human rights should come first. Well, human rights and animal liberation are, when it comes down to it, two elements of the same goal. That is and discontinuing oppressive hierarchies. There's no way to work to end oppressions that doesn't work in combination. We'll get into that when we talk about jobs in a few minutes. Uh, the answer is regenerative farming. Um, I hear that a lot these days, we'll get into that. We're natural omnivores, okay. So we're not natural carnivores. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we're natural omnivores seems to me a, a, the, that seems to express the case that we can eat a vegan. Bacon, uh, it's too expensive. It's too much work. Well, we'll see what you think after this slideshow is done. Uh, vegans harm animals too. Yeah, we do. It's kind of like that saying, you know, we're trying to suck less. And it's elitist. Well, uh, that's always kind of bizarre, isn't it? I mean, we're respecting beings that most people don't have the time of day for and so how should we approach the person who makes the objection I used to be in the debate camp I used to be well I mean I have legal training so I, I want I gravitated to debates and to people who debate and uh, no judgment, but, but for me, I am coming more and more to think exploration is the better way to go. Rather than winning an argument, let's explore the issue together. And that's really why I made this live show, because I think it's so important to go into these questions and bring them into conversations. I might not feel that way if something recently didn't didn't come over me, and that's um, the idea that I've been I needed to go car free. And the reason I needed to go car free were vegan reasons. Forty years after I became vegan, I really realized fully how important it is to veganism not to be driving. Took me a long time. So I'm I've got to be humble about this. Exploration is important to me too. As far as the healthful 
argument or the argument against veganism for health reasons. I'm not an RD and I'm not a medical doctor. Perhaps you are, but if you're not, I would say check this out and send it to their phone, okay? Um, eatright.org and it's got an article on there. It's fairly recent too. It's within the last five years. That's significant because some people will argue that all, all what we're talking about is out of date, but it's not. Uh, this continues to be endorsed here in this case by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And if you go to the site, you'll see that when they're talking about a healthy vegetarian diet, they include a vegan diet and they make it clear that the vegan diet is suitable and indeed helpful for people at all stages of life and all exercise levels and so forth. So rather than me expound on this, uh, I'd say just check out the Amer Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and see what they say because uh, it's clear that the vegan approach to uh, nourishing ourselves is stands on its own very well. It's perfectly, perfectly acceptable and laudable way to go about meeting our health and nutrition needs. So what about regenerative farming? If we had regenerative animal animal husbandry, that somehow we could either restore our climate balance or some other balance of nature. Why is the idea? Um, to me, that, no, you're hearing Chris. Okay. So Chris um, is not, it's not expressing an opinion on this actually. Chris is doing something completely different. But, um, Regenerative farming, whenever I see it, I always think the most obvious response to it is so clear that if we have regenerative, if we mean animal agribusiness when we talk about regenerative farming, what are we doing? We're saying we're going to put, it's usually cows, right? Regenerative cattle farming. And we're putting them on the land. And so who's not going to be allowed on that land? Isn't it obvious? There's going to be predator control involved here. Whereas if there were, if we instead went into only regenerative vegetable farming, we we wouldn't have um, purpose-bred animals that have to be guarded for this enterprise. So I think this is an easy one, but it tends to be complex to a lot of people. So let's look at grazingfacts.com because here again, the people who study it intensely and intensively have something to say about it. Grazingfacts.com, the truth about grazing. This is the people who put this together, work with a well-fed world and the Center for Biological Diversity. And let's just take a moment to see what they say because it's important. They say that uh, with regenerative cattle farming, you have this problem of trampling, right? Native herbivores like elk or bison rarely trample. They rarely regraze the way cattle often do. And it goes on to say that natural cycles of life, including predator-prey relationships, also maintain, we just talked about, um, they maintain the size, the sizes of native grazing herds uh, in a way that is not true for cattle, whose presence often leads to the direct killing of right wolves, coyotes, and other predators by the uh, government or the or the agribusiness enterprise. And then. We learn that claims about regenerative grazing models ignore the obvious difference between an ecosystem where carcasses of wildlife remain and nourish the habitat. 
okay? Uh, whereas cattle grazing, the cow's bodies are taken away to slaughter. Totally different, right? Wildlife carcasses play an important role in biodiversity and ecosystem function and benefit many other animals, especially in winter. And finally, well, finally, there are many, many facts and pieces of information on this website, but on this page, uh, the impact on watersheds, right? And again, this is because trampling, right? If it's cattle, there's greater erosion and sedimentation on the riverbed, on the riverside. This, I don't know if you call it an objection, but you know, I've heard this one uh, since I be since I became an advocate, and you know, it's, I've just heard it over and over. Uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In other words, you're being too perfectionist, and you're you're stopping people from you know getting partly there. Reducing the number of animal products eaten or buying free range is at least better. That was the objection. Well, do we know that? When, what we do know, what we can do instead of working for modifications. We only, we, our lives are not endless, you know, we're only here for a little while. What do we want to do with our precious years of advocacy and life? And I think we need to make every day veganism central. So every time we argue for free range, we're not doing that. And as everyday veganism spreads, those industries that exploit animals do decline. Therefore, there's your incremental step. It's going to happen. The incremental step is going to happen if we stay in the center of our ethic. They'll decline around us. But we need to let people know what the ideal is. So let's get vegan cookbooks into our local libraries or bookshops. Let's review books that have a vegan outlook. Let's help restaurants create their vegan menus. And let's start talking about not vegan options, but vegan offerings. Let's create a culture where, in which vegan living is embraced as a way to sustain our world. Not an option, but an offering. This is another one. Everyone must travel at their own pace. I guess even if it's the snail's pace. I think when we uh, hear the objection, everyone must travel at their own pace. That is a way that we can open up more of the conversation. And we can ask the person we're conversing with, what if everyone goes at a snail's pace? Is that better? <laughs> Why? Why would? Why is it better if everyone goes at a snail's pace? Let's talk about that. What are we getting out of that? What is the bio community getting out of that? What are other living communities getting out of that? If we all travel at our own pace, which could be, you know, leaves it up to human discretion. And that's that's the whole question, isn't it? Like, who are we to decide? what happens to others' lives, to others' evolution. And another one we mentioned at the very beginning with the, with the omnivore bingo card is that, um, you know, veganism is against human rights. And one aspect of that that's brought, that's, that's pointed to is, well, veganism puts working people out of jobs, okay? Well, now that we mentioned jobs, let's see what veganism spares people from having to do. Indeed, job site. B 
beef slaughter jobs. It's 37. On, uh, last summer, there were 37. Apply to butcher, production, fabricator, and more, exclamation mark. Oh, it's really exciting, right? Can't wait to do that. And they're paying, this was 2023, all time housing affordability crisis and everything else going on in 2023. And the wages are 12 to $20 an hour. Well, that's gonna make sure people continue to never get anywhere in life. That, that's great for working people, right? Uh, simply hired best, 17 best slaughter floor jobs. What are they, the 17 best slaughter floor jobs? Can actually choose from 67 slaughter floor jobs. New slaughter floor jobs are being added daily. Well, I imagine they are, aren't they? The turnover must be horrendous. Not to mention the other turnover that is that they are witnessing every minute that they're on that slaughter floor. Job monkey, meatpacking plant, slaughterhouse jobs. Find out how animals are processed into food products. Explore job opportunities in agriculture. working people out of jobs. That should happen. Nobody should have to do these jobs. We need to be serious here. We're living in a climate crisis. Those who go vegan subtract about eight, the equivalent of 8,000 miles from our annual emissions every year. Where did I get this information? From one of my former professors, Jason Zarneski, who wrote a book called Everyday Environmentalism, and it deals primarily with climate crisis. And it tells about the things you can do to ward off or to try to work for a, health, a healthier climate. And so, in this book, you find out that indeed that if the, the studies show indicate that you could take eight thousand miles off your uh, emissions every year, the equivalent thereof, and Professor Zarneski doesn't even recommend doing this. The recommendation in the book is just do it one day a week, and you know you'd be doing a lot for the environment. Well. If if you can do, if there's seven days in a week, why wouldn't you go the whole way? Why wouldn't you go vegan? As opposed to just say, cutting out animal products one day a week. I don't understand that. I don't understand why environmentalists would say, do something a little bit. Particularly right now, when we need to be all hands on deck and all the fingers And speaking of our earth and crisis, there's also a bio biodiversity crisis. So when we're talking about what's too extreme, is veganism extreme or is this the real extreme? We see here the millions of tons of land animals. So in other words, the body weight, right, of all the mammals on the planet, okay? And we see at the left, 10,000 years before the current era, how you couldn't even detect domesticated animals or humans yet. I mean, the world was full, teeming with free living life, evolving on their own terms. Now look at 1900. Suddenly, suddenly in 1900, there's a huge change. And then every 50 years from then on, Massive change, explosive changes, right? And you see all these humans in the red and their purpose-bred animals in the blue. Look at look at this 
graph and what has happened under the weight of humans and our entourage of purpose-bred animals, look at what has happened to the free. Look at what has happened to free-living animals. And tell me, vegan, being vegan is extreme? What's really extreme? People say, it's just idealistic. People won't change. People do change, though. People do change. Remember that once upon a time, we, the human community, thought that the universe revolved around us, revolved around the earth. And then, after Copernicus and Galileo, then something shifted, and it shifted completely, not in not little bits, not in little increments. It shifted completely. It took time to do it, took some time, but relatively quickly, we all discerned that Copernicus was right and that we are not the center of the universe. And so we understood the solar system. And by the same, in the same way, we can wrap our heads around the concept that we are not the center of the universe, that we are not the all important apex community of life, right? That we are one potentially contributing community rather than oppressive, dominating, domineering group that we are today. Can we change? We've changed before, it was not easy. It was not easy. People were put, at Galileo being one of them, in house arrest because of their decision to agree with the Copernican model. It wasn't easy, but it's doable. It's doable. People can and do change. So we're looking for that, that level of paradigm shift. And I need finally to thank those of you who are in the studio for the Art of Liberation who are doing your best so that we can make a paradigm shift possible.